I enjoy learning and a healthy dose of insanity, so I decided to make a full commercial video game. Specifically, I'm making a top-down twin-stick shooter in collaboration with Zed from Let's Talk Game Design. The game is titled Smash, which is an acronym for an awfully painful, much longer title. And it is inspired by Smash TV, the hands-on, no-holds-barred, do-or-die video game released originally back in 1990. Zed will of course be focused on covering the game design choices because, well, that's what he does. So be sure to go on over to his channel and follow along over there. In my devlogs, I'll be giving you a tour of the juicy and sometimes painful work that is going into developing it. In my last devlog, I shared our 3D to 2D art pipeline within Blender, but I didn't give a proper introduction to the project. And today, I wanted to talk about how we implemented some pretty awesome portals into our game. This is the glorious result of quite a bit of pain. <laughs> it's a composite of some experiments in Blender, some texture assets, and Construct 3's built-in features, including the newish timeline capabilities. Hold on to your butts. It's time to cover portals and timelines and smash, oh my. When looking for inspiration for our portals, one can't help but think of the infamous portals from Portal. <laughs> our portals don't need all the magic that is going on here though. There's no seamless transition of player from one location to the next during the runtime in our game. You see, our portals are there to present the player with choices, which Zed will cover the importance of in his channel, I'm sure. For my purposes, I just need to figure out how do I make our game engine, Construct 3, go from the room layout that the player is in to the room layout that they choose, and not have it just look like this. <laughs> which really is effectively all that we need, but that's, well, that's pretty boring. In order to leave behind the boring square sprite, sorry sprite, we all know that we need you. Thank you for making prototyping easy. So, in order to pass the proverbial torch from our wonderful square sprite onto our new juicy animation, we're going to need to figure out two main things. The first is artwork. For many people, myself included, this can be a pretty big roadblock. But since we are game devs, it's time to spend way too much time searching Google, watching tutorials on YouTube. Thank you, by the way. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoy the channel. And struggling to find just the right setting in all of our various tools. Thanks to a couple of great shader and bloom tutorials I found for Blender, I was able to put together what emerged to be a pretty epic portal. I mean, using these shader and bloom tricks, I was able to tweak all these awesome variables until I had pretty much exactly what I wanted. I mean, this is pretty awesome, and I honestly couldn't believe I was getting the results that I was. Inside the EV render engine settings, I could really make this thing glow as much as I wanted tweaking these variables. Now, <laughs> certainly all I have to do is export this animation to sprites, and I'm good to go, right? No, wrong. Alpha level problems. <laughs> so yeah, where did all my wonderful bloom go? I mean, it was there in Blender, exactly how I wanted it to look, even in the render output window. I had film set to transparency, but all of my bloom was, was, was gone. It was just gone. <laughs> Alpha is more complex than it has any business being. I eventually stumbled across a couple of primary solutions though. The first was from Game Abuse Studios, and it was to effectively render the animation twice. Once with the world background color set to black and turning transparency off. Then again with transparency turned on. Then you could take those images into the game engine of your choice, layer them on top of each other, and set the blend to add. And voila, it works. <laughs> but this did seem a little bit of a pain in the rear to me as it doubled the image memory and it made it all the more annoying to work with in the engine as it would need to be kept perfectly in alignment with each other while the game was playing. The second solution was a bit more to my liking from one of this on Medium. It involved using compositing inside of Blender so that the bloom would finally show up in the PNG file. 
checking and using this bloom box and data passes, I can now string it together into this fun thing where I could play with the color ramp to get different results. I also had to make sure that under my output properties, compositing was checked in post-processing. Make sure you do that or it won't work at all. Rendering out the animation, I was sure that I was gonna be able to put this into the game and it was gonna look great. Eh. I mean, it is kind of there, but it is still kind of missing something, if you know what I mean. Messing with the color ramp could help improve some of the results, but I wasn't quite thrilled with any of them. It didn't look as good as the first solution, even though it was an easier workflow, since I only had one set of images to work with, and it was all being rendered directly into the PNG file. So finally, I had a very big brain idea. Just don't do it. <laughs> Seriously. So I gave up on making the bloom work outside of the immediate portal and I just decided I wasn't going to show any alpha outside of that in what I was rendering inside of Blender. It's one of those moments where you just decide it's not worth it and you just have to move on and find a different solution. So I promptly headed over to the Unity Marketplace to pick up this wonderful asset pack called Magic Arsenal. Actually, I am lying to you. I already owned this asset pack because I own way too many already. Seriously, I have a problem. I grabbed some of the textures from the pack, which I now admired how well the alpha was done, and I put them into C3 and it looked great. I also decided I wanted to add a bit of blur in Photoshop to the animation on my portal background, since we would be placing an icon over the top of it. Speaking of icons, I again decided to reach into the asset collection and use assets from this wonderful pack by Panetti, which I composited in Photoshop with other items to make the final icon. And finally, the artwork was done. The second item on our list now was to animate. For animating the portal opening up into the game, I started to think about Doctor Strange's portals in Avengers. I even went through a tutorial to make a similar effect in Blender. But then I realized I would continue to have alpha level problems with this and instead looked back to the Portal series. They keep it simple and quick, which is necessary for their gameplay experience, but I figured if a quick tween into the scene worked for them, it would be perfectly acceptable for my indie game being made on the side by two people. Now at this point, my normal approach inside of Construct 3 would have been to start chaining together a sequence of tween events. In fact, that is exactly what I had done on some of my previous effects, such as when a pickup appears while playing. While this works for me, it does start to become a royal pain to update and quickly make changes to whenever I need to edit something. I recently decided to update my branding to something custom that I had designed myself, and I had a lot of fun making an intro-outro video in After Effects, which I am currently learning. After learning some of the basics, it quickly became evident that this workflow of using key points and timelines was just better for these types of things. I was also aware that Construct 3 had a timeline feature, which they had recently been improving with the announcement of their new lightweight browser-based animation software, Construct Animate. Despite being a heavy user of Construct, I had actually never taken the plunge on their timeline feature and decided now was a good time to try. And try I did. Before diving into making my own animation, I took the time to take a look at the example projects that were already available. The first one I did was a very cool high-level guided tour, which I didn't even know was a thing, um, but it took me through the very basics. I then went on to this beautiful scene of a cave bridge demonstrating a simple timeline of several pieces zooming into place to make a bridge. It showed the basics of how to manipulate an object's position and then run that timeline when triggered in the event sheet. Lastly, I played around with this pretty awesome segmented boss fight, which was really pretty epic. <laughs> I learned that I'm not very good at platformers, but I eventually managed to beat the boss. As for timelines, it demonstrated a slightly more scaled up version of the previous example. So with those behind me, it was time to try it myself in Smash. All right, so to be blunt, <laughs> the initial user experience was a bit rough. I was doing a lot more with size, scale, and opacity rather than X and Y, and I was having simple difficulties like selecting the right instance when setting the keyframes. 
I felt like I was eventually starting to get the hang of it, and after a bit of struggling, I managed to get the things to go through a series of key points to open <laughs> in a fairly straightforward manner. One thing I really did enjoy though about the timeline experience was being able to scrub forward and back inside of the editor rather than constantly going in to preview the game. I also was happy to see that I could copy and paste keyframes to save some time. After completing the timeline, I realized that in all the examples, the objects were already in the layout and their instances assigned to the timeline. In my example though, I was organizing the timeline in a different layout pool which is what I generally do. And then I load the art into the scene um, at the beginning of the layout, and I create the objects when they are needed. <laughs> so thankfully, the feature does have this set instance action, which allowed me to assign various objects to their tracks, which I just named the same as the object to keep it simple. The final silly thing I realized was, since I was messing with scale, I needed to make sure all of the sign behaviors that I had assigned to the various objects were turned off before running the timeline. Otherwise, it just wouldn't work. Finally though, I had a working setup where my event sheets would summon three different portals, assign all the newly created objects to the track, and run the timelines on each of them. This was really cool. I was super pumped when this was working. After this, I was able to take what I learned and I made a couple more timelines. One for closing the portals if they weren't selected, and one for expanding a little bit outward if it was the one that was selected. With all this in place, this is where I really see timeline shining. Everything is just more, well, organized. And if I need to edit how they look and feel, the workflow is infinitely better than what I was doing before with chaining together different tweens and basically keeping track of key points in my head. I hope that the feature continues to improve. It still feels a bit like a boxing match, but I now welcome it as an additional tool to have in my belt. And I'll likely continue to use that tool whenever I have a more extensive animation sequence that I want to put into a game. And there we have it. We have some functional portals for Smash, which look pretty cool in my opinion. I learned a lot about rendering blender effects, the joy of alpha and transparency, and the Construct 3 timeline. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe to follow along the development of Smash and wherever else game dev takes me. Let me know down in the comments what you think and thanks for watching.